Okay. I hope you guys had a nice break. Uh, we tried to help by giving you a few homeworks and quizzes, but uh, just to keep you warm so you don't actually have to forget what, what being in class feels like. But now that we're back, let's start. Shut your laptops, all the usual stuff, right? Okay, without further ado, let's just jump into the subject. We're going to continue where we left off more than 10 days ago. What was the last topic we were discussing, Pragya? LSTMs. Hmm? LSTMs? Right. So uh, here's what we were discussing, recurrent neural networks in general, right? Recurrent structures we saw can be used to model series, time series, and they can be trained by minimizing a divergence between the sequence of outputs output by the network and the sequence of desired outputs. Now, the challenge in this is defining this divergence because we are defining divergences between two sequences. And it's not merely the divergence, some of the divergences at individual instances, uh, it's generally the divergence between two sequences and the inputs and outputs may not be aligned. So even if the number of inputs and the number of outputs are the same, they may not be a one-to-one -one correspondence. For example, if I, were if I were translating English to French, the number of words may be the same, the word orders could be completely different. So uh, we're gonna be talking about this problem for the next few lectures. So here are the various variants of recurrent neural networks. The first is a conventional MLP. For every input, you have an output. Then the second one is what I introduced as a time synchronous network a few lectures ago, where you have a sequence of inputs and each input generates an output, for example, in part of speech tagging. But then you can also have the third problem, which is a, where you, a problem where you consider the entire sequence of inputs before producing an output in any sequence classification problem. Or the fourth variety, for the fourth variety where you have a sequence of inputs, and then you have a sequence of outputs, but the outputs are intermittent. You don't have an output at every instant, you have intermittent outputs, and you can see what kind of challenges might arise. And then you can have more. You can have a model where you see the entire sequence of inputs and then produce the entire sequence of outputs after the entire sequence of inputs has been considered. This would be, for example, in machine translation or something where you have a single input and then it generates a whole lot of output. This would be an instance of, uh, of language generation. For example, you see your language model, it outputs entire stories. So we're going to be looking at how we deal with these different circumstances. First, conventional MLP. This is time synchronous because if for, for an input, you will have an output. Nonetheless, you can actually have, you can use an MLP to analyze time series. You could have a series input and you would have one output <coughs> per input. The, how would you actually use a simple NLP which just takes a single input and produces a single output for a modeling series? The input now would be the individual symbols in the series. You're gonna have outputs, one per input. But then when you mod train the network, the divergence that you will consider will be the divergence between two sequences. So the way you tie the MLP up, which doesn't really have recurrence, this MLP doesn't have recurrence, but the manner in which you would actually try to capture some, something about the sequential nature of the data is through the divergence function. And a common assumption over here is to break this down and say that the divergence between two series is the sum of the divergences at the individual times, which sort of breaks down the, uh, the uh, series nature of the model itself, but is a simplifying assumption that will really help us. So uh, if I were looking at a regular MLP for uh, 
uh, to model a series, here's what you'd have. You'd have a divergence between uh, the input output sequence and the desired output sequence. Now, the assumption, very common assumption, is that the divergence, divergences between the two sequences can be modeled as the sum of the divergences at individual instance. Uh, and uh, this divergence, which is the divergence between two sequences, which is now the sum over all time of the divergences at each time between the output at that time and the desired output at that time, this is what we would minimize. And so when you are performing gradient descent, you're going to be uh, computing the derivative of this divergence with respect to each of the outputs. And of course, because we've decomposed the divergence over here as the sum of the divergences at individual columns, if I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to say this output, all I need to do is to compute the derivative of the divergence at this time, the local divergence at that time with respect to the output because you've broken the whole thing down. So this is a simplifying assumption, but again, the idea is you're tying things up and allowing an MLP to model series by considering the divergences between two series rather than two sequences rather than think on, thinking of it as a collection of individual samples. So here's a first poll. This one's easy, so 10 seconds, guys. Does anybody on Zoom want to take this question? The first one, anyone on Zoom? Is there anybody on Zoom? True. true. And what about the second one? Anyone here? Also true, right? So conventional MLPs can be used to model sequences. Uh, and the sequ in this case, the sequence nature of the problem is captured through the divergence, which is now computed between the output sequence and the desired output sequence. So we've dealt with the first problem. Now let's look at the second problem where it's a regular uh, recurrent network as we've saw it for, seen it from the first class, where you have a sequence of inputs and corresponding to each input, you're gonna have one output. And this might be a problem, for example, in uh, part of speech tagging. You have a sequence of words coming in, and for each word in the input, you have to decide what part of speech it was, whether it was a noun, whether it was an adjective, whether it was a verb, uh, whether it was a determiner. So every single word has a tag, and you want to determine what these tags are. Now, clearly, the tag that you assign to a word read depends on, you know, or it's just typed as R-E-A-D, it depends on what came before it and what comes after it, right? If for the tag for any word, depends on the context. So you can't just look at the one word and say this is a noun. You'll have to, uh, uh, the same word could be used as a verb or a noun or, or an adjective. You have to look at the entire sentence to figure out what the actual part of speech is. It may not be sufficient to just look at the past. You may also have to look at the future. So you could be using either a unidirectional model like the one to the left or a bidirectional model to the one, to, like the one to the right, which is probably more appropriate in this context. And now you want to train this model, which can look at the sequence of inputs and give you the part of speech tags. Now, once again, over here, the way you would do it is to, to uh, train the network. You're going to have a sequence of outputs being generated by the network for each input. You'd have the desired sequence of outputs and you would compute the divergence between these two sequences, and that is the divergence that you would minimize. And once so again, over here, if you want to train the network, well, on Zoom, can you please mute yourself? Yeah. Guys on Zoom, okay. So if you want to train the network, 
you need to be able to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of these outputs, because those are the derivatives that are being back propagated, right? So, uh, so long as you can count that, compute that, uh, you should be fine. And again, over here, a simplifying assumption that you can make is that the divergence between the two sequences is the sum of the divergences at the individual instance. So again, this is key. I can just say that I, the divergence between y1 to t and the desired output 1 to t is the sum over time, the divergence between yt and the corresponding dt. So if I take the derivative of the divergence with respect to any single output t at any time t, that we only need to consider the contribution of the divergence at that time because the rest of them are no longer dependent on the output at, uh, at other times. So the, the uh, divergence at any given time only depends on the output at that time and not on the outputs at other times. So if I want the derivative of the total divergence with respect to the divergence at any, to the output at any specific <coughs> instant of time, this is just going to be the derivative of the divergence at that time with respect to yt, right? So simply because you have this additive decomposition. Now, when we make this kind of an assumption, when I decompose the divergence as the sum of the divergences at individual instance, then I, uh, uh, at each time, remember, if I think of this as a classification network which is making class performing classification at each time, at each time it's going to be outputting a probability distribution over output symbols. At each time you're going to have a target output symbol. So for example, if I were performing part of speech tagging, at each time it's going to give you probabilities that the word was a noun, a verb, an adjective, and whatnot, or whatnot. And uh, you're going to have the target output which says this was a noun. You can compute the, the KL divergence or the cross entropy loss between the two. So you would have uh, a, uh, a divergence computed across entropy or KL, KL divergence computed at each time. And so the, total, so, the, so, the, so the total divergence is going to simply be the sum of the cross entropies at individual times. And now, and now you, if you want to compute the derivative of the total divergence with respect to the output at any given time, you just need to compute the derivative of the cross entropy at that time with respect to the output. So here is your second part. This is what we call the time synchronous recurrent neural, neural network because there's one output for every input. That's an easy one, I'll stop in five. Anyone want to take this one? What is the answer? Two, one and three. One and three, right? So when you have time synchronous, synchronous recurrent neural networks, you have one output for every input. The divergence between the true and the desired outputs, if you define the divergence as the sum of the divergences at individual times, the divergence between the desired and true outputs can be the sum of the divergences at the individual times, which and each of these can in turn be a cross entropy loss. So the total divergence is the sum of the cross entropy or the callback Leibler divergences at individual times. So now con let's consider this third problem. So that's just a quick summary, right? We'll revisit those, but now consider this third problem. Here, I have an output which is being produced only after the entire input has been seen. For example, if I were answering questions, or if I were giving you the sentiment of a sentence, or if I were performing uh, a wake-up word recognition, for instance, in speech, you want to see the entire input before you decide what the answer is. Answering at any other point could be considered premature. So uh, in this case, here's the situation. The situation, you'd have the entire input coming in, like if you're doing question answering, you'd, the, 
question would be color of sky. You'd have to wait to see the word sky, otherwise it doesn't make sense. You don't know what, the, what you know, the object is, whose color you're guessing. So the output only comes at the end of the input. Or if you were performing speech recognition, you'd see the entire input, and then you'd say, this is the sound, ah. And now, when I'm performing inference in this model, it's straightforward enough. I see the entire input, and then when the input is done, I have an output. Now, and, but then what happens at the intermediate stages? Can anyone tell me? What's happening before the final output? Does the network produce outputs before the final output? Yes. It does, right? The network has not changed. The only thing that changed was your reading of the output. And so at each of those other intermediate times as well, <coughs> the network has continued to produce an output, which might keep changing with time. And then when, when you get to the final output, that's when you decide, this is where I'm sure that it has the correct answer, and then you're going to uh, read it. Now, when you're training the network, at that final instant, you're gonna have an output, and you have the desired output. Like the input is color of sky, it gives you some output, it says pink, you know the desired output is blue, there's a divergence between the two. That divergence is now going to be back propagated, you compute the derivative of it with respect to the output at the final time, and back propagated to update the parameters of the network. But then, this is making a, uh, this is losing something. It's actually ignoring the fact that the network is outputting values at other times as well. How can I exploit that? How can I exploit the fact that I, the network is actually producing outputs at other times? Anyone? You yes. Go ahead, Rebecca. Uh, if you have a variable length input, so if you have like a multi-word sentence possibility, then you can yeah, but I'm giving you exactly this problem. Okay. Then what would you do? Yeah. I can just pretend that the, that the output at every time must be the same, right? For example, if I'm performing speech recognition, it's not merely at the, I would like the answer, the network to be as confident of the answer as early as possible. And the answer hasn't changed through the, I mean, in principle, the answer really shouldn't have changed. And so I can just say that I can just replicate the desired output at every instant. And now my divergence is going to be the sum of the divergences of the individual instances, except that it's going to be a weighted sum, where the weight can be how, how confident I am that it should be giving the correct answer at this time. And of course, depending on the problem, that weight is changing. If I have a speech recognition problem, it doesn't matter whether you're seeing a little bit of R or a long portion of R, it's still R. So you want the weight to be one at each time. On the other hand, if you're performing a uh, question answering, if you're question answering, you don't really want it to decide on the word blue till it knows what it's answering a question about. And so then the weight would be one at the final instant and zero at other times. But the more general, the general idea is this, that you can just sort of assume that it's producing a valid output at each time and that the answer is smeared over the entire input. And now what we have done is taken what was a net network that only produced an output at the end and converted it to a time synchronous network. And now we're just using the standard techniques of time synchronous networks to train the network. So that easy, that, that clear to everybody? Any questions? Okay, now let's go to the more complex one. This is the one that's going to trouble us for the next couple of lectures. This is the one where I have what I call an order synchronous but time asynchronous output. For example, uh, if I were performing speech recognition, I say, hello, how do you do? Then you want it to how many words have I spoken? And I say, hello, how do you do? Five, right? So how many outputs would you expect? Five also, but the input is, you know, something like three seconds of speech or two seconds of speech. At, and we've been analyzing it at 100 frames per second. So you have 200 inputs and five outputs. Now, are these five outputs occurring everywhere? No, right? The output is gonna tell you at the end of hello, this was the word hello. 
At the end of how, this was the word how. At the end of do, this was the word do, right? And so the number of outputs, the outputs are intermittent. The input is continuous, but there's an order correspondence between the input and the output. Meaning if I change the uh, speech order in which the speech sounds are produced, if I take the first portion and stick it at the end, the output order also changes. So there's a very clear one-to-one -one correspondence between the input sequence order and the output sequence order. So there's an output, there's an order correspondence, but there's no time, but, but it's not time synchronous, right? So now let's think of, so like, so, so let's consider this problem, right? Inference, if I'm given a sequence of inputs, like in speech, I want the network to output symbols intermittently. We may not know exactly where the networks, the outputs must occur, right? And, but then this is just many concatenations of the first model, right? I've taken the first model and just kept attaching many copies of it to itself. This thing makes things very complicated. And what is the reason for the complication? The fact is that, as we know, the network is actually outputting something at every time. There's no oracle telling you, I must read the output at time seven, time 23, and time 54. It's just outputting something at every time. You need some way of deciding when to read the output. And this, and this answer is not obvious, right? So of all of these outputs, which are the real outputs? Now to answer this question, we'll have to look at what the network is actually producing. If I'm performing, say, speech recognition or part of speech tagging, whatever else, at each time, the network is performing a local classification task. There's a collection of symbols that it could be generating. If I'm doing speech recognition, there's a collection of phonemes or maybe a collection of words, any one of which could be output. So the network is actually producing or computing a probability distribution over the output symbols at each time. And so the actual output of the network is going to be this table. At each time, it's going to be giving you the probability distribution over all the symbols in the vocabulary given, but it's a conditional probability. What's it conditioned on? So at say time three, when it gives you the probabilities of all of the, over all of the words, how much input has it seen? Three, right? So at each time, it's giving you P of YT given inputs one, two, T, right? So at each time, it's actually giving you, for, so over here, for instance, if I look at uh, YD4, that's the probability assigned to the symbol D at the fourth instant by the network. But this is in fact the probability that it has estimated for that the fourth output must be D given all inputs zero through four. That making sense to everybody? Right? So any questions? Because I'm just gonna build off of this. So if you have the slightest doubt, this is where you ask me after this, you'll get lost. None? All right, yes. What is X zero through four? These are the inputs. So right, so if I'm giving you like a sequence of speech vectors, First zero speech director, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Uh, is there a general threshold to decide, like, like a constant to decide whether this syllabus, this part should produce a word or not? We, that's the whole problem. That's what we're gonna be dealing with, right? Because we don't know. So now, here is the question, right? Let me ask you the question. This is what the network has output. But I know that the network, to answer your question, that we, I know the network outputs must be intermittent. So no, given that I know that the outputs must be intermittent, how could I use these outputs, this information, to generate intermittent outputs? Anybody want to guess? Maybe you could use the probability distribution. Yeah, but you have a probability distribution at every time. Yeah. Hmm? We are sort of, you know, here's what I can do. Now, remember again, any neural network with a softmax or logistic output is actually outputting an estimate 
of the a posteriori probability distribution over all symbols given all inputs until that time, right? So what do we do when I perform classification using a neural network? What we actually do, and this is very important, we are performing maximum a posteriori probability classification. So when I pick a class, the network is giving you the probabilities of all of the classes given the input. You are picking the most likely class as considered by the network, which is to say picking the class for which the a posteriori probability of the class is the most given the input, right? So actual classification is argmax over i, yi given x, which is the class that's most probable given that this is the input you have. And so that's really the problem out here as well. What we want to do is to get the most likely symbol sequence, which is shorter than the input in length, right? Given the entire input. Is that making sense to you guys? Right? I have this two second, 200 frames of speech. Which sequence of words or which sequence of phonemes has the highest probability given these 200 frames of speech? Right? This is the problem, what we're answering. So once I tell you this, can you give me some answers? How would I do this? Once you look at the Bayesian perspective, any guesses? Okay, let me help you, right? I'll give you a greedy solution. I just pick the most likely symbol at each time, right? And then when I pick the most likely symbol at each time, I know going back here that a symbol is basically going to be repeated through the, ideally going to be repeated through the duration of the symbol, right? And the final instance where it's been output is when I decide this symbol actually happened. So the greedy solution, which obviously being greedy is not the best thing you can do, is going to say, I just pick the most likely symbol at each time. And then I can group these things up like so, saying, you know, this entire sequence is a sequence of Fs. So I think this was the sound F over this duration the actual output must be at the end. And so the red symbols are, would be the ones that you would output, right? What could be a problem with something like this? Pardon me? Assuming that the predictions are fine. <coughs> Assuming that the correct predictions are accurate. I mean, you want it being based. Yes. Repetitions. Repetitions, you won't know whether the person had two Fs over there or one F, this simple logic is gonna fail, right? So, uh, you know, you can't really distinguish between an extended symbol and repetitions of the symbol. And of course, the, you know, if I'm producing speech, I know the sequence of phonemes has, has to be a valid word. This is meaningless. This is, you know, what's creed, I have no idea, right? So uh, this is, so what we can do is to sort of impose external uh, restrictions on what sequences can be considered. For example, only allow sequences corresponding to dictionary words or use some se special separating symbols. We'll see these later, but the general idea of greedy decoding must be clear to you by now. Also the issues, right? We'll refer to the process of obtaining an output from the network as decoding, just terminology. So here's the other thing. If I just pick the sequence of symbols and then merge them, this is going to give, this is a greedy solution, right? And a greedy solution is not necessarily the optimal solution. What this is doing is finding the most probable time synchronous sequence, meaning you're picking the most probable symbol at each time, right? So you're picking one output at each time and then you're merging them but the most probable time synchronous sequence is not necessarily the most probable order synchronous sequence. So just merging these things can end up giving you noisy stuff, right? We'll see a little more of, of this as well. So we've sort of partially addressed how I can get a sequence of outputs given a sequence of inputs. If you have the model, you're gonna to have to revisit this. There's something broken, right? But then how do you train this model? I give you this collection, I give you this recording, it's 20 seconds, uh, it's two seconds to uh, 100 frames of speech. And I tell you this represents the word sequence, hello, how do you do? 
that means that you have this input sequence and you have output symbols at each time, right? At, at specific times. Now suppose I told you, now here's the thing. In this problem, the length of the output sequence is always going to be no longer than the length of the input sequence. You cannot have an output sequence that's longer than the input because after all the output is intermittent and the output is order synchronous, right? It has order correspondence. So now suppose I gave you the exact times at which each symbol occurred. So for example, I said, here's a recording. This is the recording, hello, how do you do? The word hello occurred till time point four. Then how went from point four to point seven? You know, do went from point eight to 1.1. And so I gave you the exact durations of each of the words. That means you now know exactly at which point in time, corresponding to which input, each of the outputs must be generated. So in this case, uh, so here for example, this is the word but, I have a recording for it. You might be informed that the phoneme b ends at x2, r ends at x6, and the t ends at x9, right? The ninth time instant. This, okay, how would you train the models using this information? But before we get to continue with this, I want to introduce a notion of an alignment. What is an alignment? Here is an input which is nine, 10 vectors long. The output is three symbols long, right? But then I gave you some extra information. Exactly at, at which input each of these three outputs occurred. So I'm telling you that the phoneme B aligns with X0 through XT, X2. That the phoneme R aligns with X3 to, through X6 and T aligns with X7 through X9, right? So these time steps give us an alignment of the output sequence to the input sequence. Which portion of the input aligns to what symbol? Now, if I just tell you that this was the word sequence, this, this, this input cor corresponded to this word but, that doesn't have enough information for you to decide where each of the words occurred, right? So simply knowing the output sequence doesn't provide you the alignment. Knowing where each of these things actually ended is extra information. And there are many different ways of aligning a given order correspondent sequence to an input, yes? So can we consider an LB symbol as well? Pardon me? Can we consider an LB symbol as well? The output is empty and the other We'll get to that, you could, right? But, uh, but regardless, you wouldn't know how many empty symbols you have. So you still don't know the alignment. Right. The point is you don't know where, the point is you don't know where these things must come out. That information is not given. And so for any given input, there are many different ways of aligning the input to the output. Does that making sense to you guys? Right? So let's go back to this problem. I give you this training data, training instance, and I give you the alignment. I tell you exactly at which, which time each of these symbols must be output. So I know that for instance, B, Go, the sound b goes from x0 through x2, r goes from x3 to x6, and t goes from x7 to x9. So b must be output at two, r must be output at six, t must be output at nine. In this case, how would I train the model? Simple. I can just compute the model's outputs at each time, but I know where which outputs are important, right? So I can just look at the output at time two and I know this must represent the sound bar. I can just look at the output at time six, and I know that this must be the sound uh, right? And then, and then I can just look at the output at time nine, and I know this must be the, the, the sound ta. And this, these are the divergences that I would have. I would have the sum of the divergences at each of these three instants, and that sum of the divergence, that sum is what I'm going to be using to train the network. What is the issue here? Yeah, and what is the issue with ignoring the intermittent outputs? So at the intermittent times too, the network is producing outputs, right? And what could be happening is that if you're just reading the outputs at these times, you're ignoring what happened intermi intermittently, it might have just been producing Z, B, C, B, right? Z, Z, 
And then for i, it might have been producing a bunch of random symbols and just happens to produce i at the correct time. So the fact that these things must be continuous, that is lost, right? So what you really want to do is to assume that, that it has produced the same symbol throughout. And then you compute the total divergence over all of these. And when you do that, now of course, you're going to have the total divergence is going to be the sum of the, over all inputs of the KL divergence between the symbol assigned to that input and the desired symbol assigned to that input. And the desired symbol has been obtained by repeating the symbol through the duration of the input that corresponds to that symbol, right? And more specifically, this is again, this is, this is going to come back in, uh, and affect us. When I have a one hot representation of the output and I have a probability being assigned to every symbol by the network, what is the KL divergence between a one hot representation of an output and the desire and the actual output of the network. Anyone remember? So your one hot representation of the output is going to, suppose I have symbols A, B, C, D, E. This is my vocabulary, right? Then at any time, your one hot representation is going to say this, the actual symbol here is supposed to be C, right? And your network is going to give you some P, A, PB, PC, PD, PE. How did we define the divergence between these two? We've been through this, guys. Anyone remember? Lakshay? Like okay, that's not that's the easy answer, but do you remember? Where did that come from? Anybody remember? How did we define the cross entropy? Enter. Eight weeks through the semester, so you must be able to answer, right? How did we define that? Anybody remember? Someone on Zoom? Someone said something, yes. What was that? Negative? No, it's, it was, in this case, it's going to be, you know, it's summation over all the vocabulary, right? The desired probability of the vocabulary log of the prob probability assigned to that vocabulary symbol by the network. So you're correct, right? And this was going to be zero for all of these guys. And so you're, you're only left with this one term. And so that's simply going to be the negative of the log of the probability assigned to the target symbol at that time. And this is what you're summing over all time. Is this ringing a bell, guys? May I see some hands raised if this is ringing a bell? It should, right? As if the hand is not particularly raised, then it hasn't rung a bell. So this is how it's supposed to be. And we're gonna go back to this, okay? And so now in this case, we know exactly how to train the model. I have this guy. I've repeated my target symbol at each time. And based on the repeated target symbol, I know the probability assigned to the target symbol at each time by the network. Minus log of that is the local cross entropy. I sum this over all time. This is the divergence that I'm actually gonna be minimizing. Yes? Shouldn't there be some form of weighted uh, summing instead of direct summing? Meaning? Like, uh, I'm just assuming the speech technician, all of them are equally important. Wait, like, let's say I'm saying the sound R. Uh, Towards the end, that R should have higher weightage than towards the start of it. Ideally, I'd like the network to be very confident at every time. So that's the assumption. You can have those, but this is what we're saying, okay? But yes, again, you have your, you end up with the heuristic of what this weight must be, so we'll, we won't, right? Uh, so now, suppose I only give you this. I don't give you the time sequence. I don't tell you where each word ended. All I tell you is here is this two second recording. This is the, the, this is the uh, sentence, hello, how do you do? Or here is this 10 frame recording, and this was the word but. How do you compute the divergence now? Anybody? Thank you, right? The problem is we don't know the alignment. And so 
We know how to train if the alignment is provided. The problem is the alignment is not provided, right? So as Lakshya says, we are left with this additional challenge. We must guess the alignment. And there's an alternate possibility. We can say, I'm not sure what the alignment is. I'm going to consider all alignments. There are two various ways of looking at it. Let's look at the first one, right? How we can actually do the guessing the alignment. So what I would do is I have this model. Let's say I'm training the model. I'm going to be training the model iteratively, right? At each time, I have, an, I have some current uh, version of the model. Using the current version of the model, I'm going to try to guess the alignment using the current version of the model. And then using this alignment, I can train, I can train my model. But the alignment is likely to be poor, especially in the beginning of the training. So now I can use my new model and then go back and refine my alignment. And then I can use the refined alignment to go back and retrain the model and repeat the process, right? So we're going to start off with some initial alignment or some initial model and get an initial al alignment. You train the network using that alignment and then you re-estimate the alignment for each training instance using the new model. So, but then here, there's a lost point. What is the missing component here? You know how to do most of this. What is the missing component? Anyone? I've highlighted it in blue. Do you know how to do that? How, if I gave you a model, I give you a 200 frame input, and I say, this is the word sequence, hello, how do you do? Or in my example, a 10 frame input. And I say, this is the word, but. How are you going to, and I have a model, right? Using this model and the input, how do you decide where the symbols ber, uh, and ter must happen? That is the alignment problem, right? And we have to determine this alignment. So again, the alignment tells us which portion of the input aligns to what symbol on the sequence. So here are three different ways of aligning the word but with the input, right? But then I can also, instead of just saying that this word ber ends at time six, or the sound ber ends at time three, uh, uh, ends at seven, you know, ter ends at 10, I can say that ber sort of goes from zero to four, right? And ter uh, goes from whatever, five to zero to three, and uh goes from uh, four to seven, and so on, right? So an alignment can be represented as a repetition of symbols. So when I just tell you this is the but, B, A, uh, uh, B, uh, and T, this is the order synchronous sequence, order, or order corresponding sequence, but it doesn't have time synchrony. I can make it time synchronous by repeating each symbol, right? So I'm going to make call the time synchronous version of the order, order synchronous symbol sequence as the expansion. So these are three different expansions of but. And in all cases, I have three different time synchronous sequences. They correspond to but, so but is the compression of the time synchronous sequence. So going from the order synchronous sequence to the time synchronous sequence is expansion, and going from the time synchronous sequence to the order synchronous sequence is compression, this terminology that I'm introducing, right? So for but, the same asynchronous you know, order corresponding, but it's not time synchronous sequence, right? That can be expanded in many different ways to align it to an input. And simultaneously, I can have many different alignments for an input which can come, uh, many different time synchronous outputs, which can all compress to the same symbol sequence. This making sense to guys, everybody? So, yes. All we know is that in this stage, but was said. Yes. We are uh, trying out different alignments. But how do we know exactly like which alignment is right? We don't, so we'll, we'll get to that, right? So here is the problem, right? My problem is I'm given but, and my challenge is to find, which is the compressed sequence, and I want, my challenge is to find the expanded sequence for it. That is my problem of finding the alignment. Right? So alternately stated, I want, to the, I want to find, given the compressed sequence, 
I want to find the expanded sequence which is most probable for it. In other words, given but, there are many such possible expansions of but, I want to find out which one is the most probable one, given not just the but, but also the input sequence, right? Because the input is also given. So this is the problem of aligning this symbol sequence to this input. I want to find the expanded sequence. Is this making sense to everyone? Right. So this is very similar to decoding, right? When we were decoding, we were just given the input and you were, I was asking you to find the symbol sequence. But what we did there was to find in the greedy decoding problem, we found the most uh, probable time synchronous sequence given the input, right? This is like saying, find me the most probable time, time synchronous sequence given not just the input, but also the actual sequence that it must compress to. Right? So here's the poem. I'll give you the full minute for this one. Okay, 10 seconds, guys. Okay, someone on uh, Zoom, can you tell me if that first statement is correct? Just the first statement, is it correct? What about the second statement also on Zoom? Can someone tell me? The third one, someone here? Is the third statement right? Fourth? Fifth? Okay, right? An order synchronous symbol sequence that's shorter than the input can be aligned to the input by repeating symbols until the expanded sequence is exactly as long as the input, right? The alignment of an order synchronous symbol sequence to an input is a time synchronous symbol sequence. I took something that was three symbols, I kept repeating it till you had as many symbols as the input itself as the length of the input itself. A symbol, symbol sequence that's time synchronous with an input can be compressed to a shorter order synchronous sequence by deleting repetitions. And order synchronous symbol sequence that are shorter than the input are basically compressed symbol sequence, right? There are many ways of going from an order synchronous sequence to a time synchronous sequence. Is there a unique compression of a time synchronous sequence? Repetitions. It is not unique, right? We saw this example. Is it two Fs or a single F? So you have to remember this, okay? So now let's go back here. I'm told, for example, that this word, this symbol, the, this, I have this word sequence, which is say the word beefy. For some strange reason, I chose the word beefy many years ago and I'm too lazy to re redo my figures, so I'm gonna stick with it, okay? Uh, now, uh, so I'm told that this recording corresponds to the word beefy, right? And let's say all the symbols in my vocabulary are these ones, a, b, d, a, e, f, and g, that's all I have. How do I use this probability table I currently have a model. How do I use this probability table and the fact that this is the word beefy to generate an alignment from this? You can, let's, can you give me a process for it? Okay, so, that, so hold that thought, right? First, let's do the cheapest thing. If I just pick the most likely symbol sequence of symbols in each time, is this going to give me beefy? No, right? What is wrong? I'm getting sounds that are not in beefy, right? 
So to go back to what Bala was saying, I know that this is the word beefy. It only has b, e, and for in it. So I can block out everything except these guys, which is the same as saying that I'm going to be taking the rows from the probability table corresponding to b, e, and for and copying them over, right? What do I do with this? Yeah, I do, but what else do I do? If I just pick the most probable symbol at each time, right? We're only going to be decoding on this reduced table at this point, right? Because we've thrown the rest of them away. And so we know that only the appropriate symbols are going to be being considered. But if I just pick the most likely symbol at each time, is this going to become beefy? <laughs> You need to consider the order as well, right? For here, for example, this is beef, fi. I don't know, this is not the word you want, right? You have to be more explicit. And how would you consider the order? You're on a roll, go ahead. <laughs> like, but you don't know how, how long but lasts, right? So here is what we're gonna do, right? Anybody else want to take a guess? Yes. Make a flag that we saw in you, like kind of some kind of flag that we just Yeah, that's going to become more complex. I'll give you a cheap and easy trick, okay? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to copy the burrow on top. I'm going to copy the E row second. I'm going to copy the fur row third and the E row fourth. So I'm taking each one of the symbols that I've got and I'm pulling out the rows corresponding to that symbol and creating a new table. Mm -hmm. Observe that this table can actually have multiple copies of the same symbol. Why? In this case, I had the word beefy, right? So the first row is b. I know this is the first symbol. The second symbol is e, so the second row corresponds to the second symbol. I know the third symbol is f, so the third row corresponds to the third symbol. And I know the fourth symbol is E, so the fourth row corresponds to the fourth symbol. I'm sort of pulling the row corresponding to each of the symbols out and making a separate new table with it. And now, in this table, if I start off by, I can think of this table as some kind of a graph, right? The anything, any path through this table that starts at the top left and monotonically goes down to the bottom right, there's going to be a path like this. It's going to go through the burr row for a little bit. Then it's going to go through the E. Then it's going to go through the fur. Then it's going to, going to go through the E again, right? This will compress to beefy, yeah. guaranteed, because initially it's got a repetitions of burr. Then it's got repetitions of E. Then it's got repetitions of fur. Then it's got repetitions of E again, right? And so what I need to do now is that I want to find a path through this table which starts from the top left corner and comes to the bottom right corner. But then it has some extra rules. And I want to find the path that is most probable, right? But it has some extra rules that the path can only go straight or one step down. It cannot skip a row because if it skipped a row, it means the corresponding symbol is being skipped, right? E must follow bar, fur must follow E, E must follow fur, right? So that means these edges are the only edges, only directions that are permitted when you are going through this table. And so I can assign, now when I copied the probability, again, I want you to remember that when I copied these row over like so, each row is representing a, a sequence of probabilities, right? I had a probability table computed by the network. I copied an entire row of probabilities over. So this table on top is basically a table of probabilities. On top of the table, I've imposed a collection of edges which tell you which direction you can go, you can travel in, right? And those edges basically are, they're, they're just guides. They tell you which way the path can go. They have, you know, if you had to assign a probability to them, it's like saying they have a probability of one but it's, they're basically just basically guides, right? And now uh, the score, we want to find a path from top left to bottom right that follows these arrows. 
and that is most probable. We want to find the most probable path from top left corner to bottom right corner, which follows these arrows, and you're guaranteed that if you can find this, this is the most probable alignment of B phi to the input. Yeah. This is only doing training, right? I'm finding the alignment for an input. Correct? And so, now let's see how we can actually compute this most likely path. You can use any uh, graph algorithm over here. I have a graph, Every I can think of each box in my table as a node. These edges give you, these arrows give you the edges. And then I can take any graph search algorithm, which finds the most, pro it's, it's a directed graph, it's acyclic, it's starting from the top left corner, it's going to the bottom right, and any path which is finds, the, any graph algorithm which finds the most highest scoring path through this graph is going to give me the most likely alignment. Right? Is that making sense to you guys? Right. And one specific uh, algorithm for this which is really efficient is the Viterbi algorithm. So for this, we want to consider one thing. Consider a path like the one that's highlighted in blue. This path represents the simple sequence bur, bur, e, e, fur, correct? And the probability of the path is simply going to be the probabilities of the individual symbols and the path. It's going to be the probability of b, which is y0 b, probability of b at time zero, which is going to be y0 of b, right? Right there, times the probability of b at time one, times the probability of e at two, times the probability of e at three, times the probability of four at four. So this, the probability of the path is the product of the probabilities of all the symbols and the path. And now, I want to find a path that has, that goes from the top left to the bottom right, which is most probable. So I want to find the path such that the product of the, all the nodes in the path is the greatest, right? And here's how you, but then, if you want to do this the naive way, you have, we want to consider every possible path from the top left to the bottom right, compute its probability, and then sort of look through all of these and pick the one that's most likely. In this case, that number is going to be large. In the worst case, it can be exponential in the length of the, the length of the input. So you really don't want to be uh, doing that, right? So what we will do is to do this using a dynamic programming algorithm. There, there are many other algorithms, but all of them are basically some version of, uh, of uh, DP because it's time synchronous. Uh, and we're going to find the most probable path from the source to the sink using this algorithm. So for this, we make, we make use of a very simple fact. I'm just going to represent those squares by circles. So let's say I want to find the most probable path from this guy to this. And say these are my edges, right? So clearly, the most probable path here can only have come from either here or here. It could not have come from anywhere else, correct? So the most probable path to this node is either the most probable path that goes this way or the most probable path that goes this way. So for any node, you only have to consider the, the parents. And the most probable path to the node is one of the, uh, through a, goes through one of the parents, right? And what is the probability of the most probable path? Now, if you look at the path this way, now this path, if this were the most probable path, then this guy must also be the most probable path to this node, right? Because if it was the second most probable path to that node, I wouldn't consider it. I just consider the most probable path, right? Anything else is going to have a lower probability, right? So if my most probable path over here was of this kind, then this guy must have been the most probable path, right? Uh, to this node. If the most probable path were this one, then this guy too must have been the most probable path to this node, right? So to decide, which of these paths I must take. All I need to consider is this. 
I have the most probable path over here. What is the probability of that path? I have the most probable path over here. What is the probability of that path, right? So let's say the probability of this path is say 0.7, and say the probability of this path is say 0.4. Which of these do two is going to be the most probable path to my destination node? 0.7, it has to go through 0.7, right? Because if I extend 0.4, it's going to be a lower probability guaranteed, right? And so this is a very simple logic. What we are going to do is the best path to any node must be an extension of the best path to one of the parent nodes. Any other path would necessarily have a lower probability. So the best parent for any node is basically the parent with the highest best path score, right? Yes, Adnan. Let's say um, the other numbers from the parent to this node is the 0.4 has a probability one and the 0.7 has a probability half. When you multiply the so that is the two best path probability, right? That's it. So this is 0.7 is the, it's not the node probability, it's the path. There's no additional probability. You think the overall path, including the path from the parent to child could have a different probability than just- Again, this is, when, when you go from here to here, what are you doing? Bring 0.7 into this one then. Into this guy, right? The edge has no score. The edge has no score? Yeah, we're just looking. The edge is just a guide, as I mentioned, right? Correct. So given this, you're guaranteed that you only have to consider the parent, right? And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to dynamically track the best path and the score of the best path from the source node to every node in the graph. At each node, we keep track of the best incoming parentage and the score of the best path from the source node to the node through this and the score of the best path from the source node to the node through the best parentage and eventually compute the best path from source to sink. It's a lot of English, but then let's take a look at this in examples. Do I have the, uh, for some reason, the actual slide is missing. So here's what I would do, right? I'm going to introduce some notion, some notation over here. So this notation, Y subscript T superscript S of R, is basically the probability assigned to the rth symbol at time t. So for example, if my symbol sequence is beefy, then the, first, the zeroth symbol is b, right? The first symbol is e, so is the third. And the second symbol is f, right? So over here, the first row is going to be, is going to be the probability assigned to the symbol b at each time. The second row is the probability going to be assigned, that's assigned to the symbol E at each time by the network and so on. Now let's consider the very first time. At the very first time, I know that only that we must start from the top left corner, right? So the best path score to the top left corner node is simply the node score itself. If I had only the first symbol, if I had only the first input, then I know that the second, third, and fourth uh, rows of the table are not valid starting points. So the best path scores to those guys are zero. To the top left, but at the top left position, the best path score here is going to be the y zero b in this case, correct? Now what are the best parents? Is the first column. There are no parents, right? So none of them have any parents. But then let's go to the next time instant. At the next time instant, I can, I'm going to go from the top to the bottom, and I'm going to pick up for each node the best parent, right? Now consider that, and the, so I, I'm going to go from top to bottom, and for each node, I want to find the parent that has the highest score. So here, for example, I had two parents, the best path score to the parent one was 0.7. The best path score for the parent two was 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So I picked 0 0.7. This is the best parent, right? And so I say this guy's best parent is this one. And the best path score to this node is 0 0.7 times this node probability when I extend it, right? So that's all I'm going to be doing. I'm going to go through all of the nodes. I scan through the parents. I find the best parent, the parent with for who the best path score to that node 
as largest. And then I know that over here, the best path over here is this guy. So the best path score to this node is the, is the best path score of the parent times the node probability. Very simple logic, correct? Symbols apart, this makes sense to everybody, right? And so we can see how this will go. If I look here, look at the very first node, how many parents does it have? So who's the best parent? There's the only one parent, right? And what is the best path score of this guy? That's just going to be the best parent times the node score, right? So easy. So for the best path, the best parent is zero, and the best path score at you know time t to the zeroth node is the best path score at time zero t minus one of the zeroth node times y t zero, right? But then you consider the rest of these guys. The rest of these guys have two parents each, right? A, a, a node on the Lth row has one of two possible parents. Either the same node at the previous time, the Lth row at the previous time, or the L minus one row at the previous time. There are only two possible parents, right? And so I'm going to say the best parent is L minus one if the best path score to L minus one. So again, L minus one is the previous row, right? So the best parent is this guy, if the best path score here is greater than the best path score here, otherwise the best parent is this guy, right? So you're saying that the best parent is L minus one if the best path score to row L minus one at the previous time is greater than the best path score to row L at the previous time, otherwise the best parent is L. There are only two possible parents, right? And then the best path score to the node itself is going to be the best path score to the best parent times the node score. So you're keeping track of both the best parent and the best path. Now, the second node has only one best parent because all the remaining guys have zero score at time one. And of course, the third and the fourth, regardless of which parent you score choose, the probability is zero, so it doesn't really matter, right? And so now, those are gonna be zero. And if you just scan through top to bottom, you're going to get the best path scores to each of the nodes in the column. And for each node, you're going to get the best parent. Right, then I can go to the next time. Again, the first entry over there has only one parent. It just happens to be a special case over here, right? And so the best path to the zero throat entry over here is the best parent is zero, and the best path score is going to be simply the uh, best path score to the zeroth node times the current node score. But then the rest of them follow the same logic as before. You look at the two, two parents and you pick the parent which has the highest best path score. You retain a pointer to the best parent. So at each time, you know who the best parent is, right? And then you also extend, compute the best path score to the current node as the extension of the path to the best parent. So it's the probability of the best path score to the best parent times the current node score, right? It's a lot of words, but the, but the uh, logic is very straightforward. And so you can do this and you can compute this for every node in the third column. You can use, so now you have the best path scores for all the nodes. You have the best parents and the best path scores for all the nodes in the third column. You can use those and repeat the same process to find the best parents and the best path scores to all the nodes in the fourth column. Use those in the fifth column and compute the best path best parents and the best path scores to every node in the fifth column and so on, all the way till you get to the end, right? So is this clear to everybody? Any questions? It's very simple to code. It's like three lines of code if you actually write, write with three or four lines of code. It's literally just this logic over here, right? And now what happens, you know that the, uh, you know that at the final time, your best path must end at this node, right? And because you have that information, now all you need to consider is this guy. You know your best path must end over here. For every node, you know the best parent, right? So you can track this node, you have stored that information, so you find that one's best parent. But then you know that guy's best parent, and then so you just work your way back to best parents, and you're going to get the best overall 
path through this table, which also now happens to be the most probable alignment of the input to the symbol sequence. Making sense to everybody? Right? Can I hear an enthusiastic yes? I know you're sleeping. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay, also on Zoom. Lovely, right? I love that. Finally, the Zoom connection is working. And so now I'm gonna have a best path sequence through the, through the table, which gives me that my most probable alignment of the input to my compressed symbol sequence. I'm going to use this most probable alignment now as the next, my next best guess for the alignment and use that to train the model. So here's another poll. <laughs> That's on Zoom, I think. All right, 10 seconds, guys. All right, does someone on Zoom want to tell me if the first statement is correct? They give the answer one, two. One, two. They don't even wait, do they? Right. So, uh, Everyone agree with this, right? The, so this procedure algorithm we saw was called Viterbi decoding. It finds the most probable alignment of a compressed order synchronous sequence to an input. And so uh, this basically generates the most probable time synchronous sequence given the order synchronous sequence. Yes, what's the question? So it's also open, like the network is like randomly initialized. That's your best guess given the model at this point. Given the model, that's your best guess. Right? It doesn't mean that it's going to be correct, but no, having what you have, that's your best guess. That's it. Yeah. You are essentially training the model using these alignments, but the way you're creating the model, the alignment is with the untrained model itself. So yeah. How can you be sure it will actually converge to the right? So think of it this way, right? You have, you're trying to find the most probable, uh, you're, uh, again, remember this. Many classes ago, I told you this was maximum likelihood estimation. We'll repeat this again, right? So given the symbol sequence and the input, you want to find the most probable model, the model that assigns the highest probability to it. So here you've just added an extra variable, which is the alignment. So you're simultaneously finding the most likely alignments and the best model, right? So when you're trying to find two variables simultaneously, you can flip, fix the one and guess the other, fix the other and guess the one and flip back and forth. And it's guaranteed to have a, a monotonic uh, monotonic behavior, if you find the optimum. I'll take this after the class is done once I'm, I have very few minutes left, right? So Viterbi decoding is run on a table of probabilities constructed from the compressed sequence with one row for each symbol, derived from the probability table generated by the, uh, generated from the output of the recurrent network. It doesn't simply rec select the most probable entry in each column. You have the sequence constraint, right? And so I have, uh, let's skip that, right? So now, given my current model and the symbol sequence, this decoding has given me the best guess for alignment, right? I can use that alignment over here against the outputs of the network and now I have my way of, I have an alignment, so I have, I have timestamps. I can go back, this has gone back to the time synchronous problem. I can find my divergence and I can optimize my divergence, right? So, and what is the divergence going to be? Again, so here is the key piece. We're going to see this again and again and again. I have my best guess for the alignment so I'm going to be assuming that the, I'm, I'm, because I have a sim, symbol to symbol correspondence, my divergence is the sum over all time of the cross entropy between the output of the network and the aligned output, the aligned symbol. 
this align symbol is now my target. It doesn't mean that it's the ideal target, but it's your best guess for a good target, right? And so you're going to compute at each time the KL divergence between the output of the network and the symbol at that time on the most likely path. And this KL divergence, as we know, is simply going to be the negative of the log of the probability assigned to that symbol by the network at time t. Right? So, if I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to, say, the probabilities at assign, the, the probabilities output by the network at time four, then all I need to consider is the fourth instant because the rest of the outputs don't, you know, or the, the, because that's, that's the only portion of the divergence that uh, considers the fourth output, right? Or in general, if I want the derivative of the divergence with respect to yt, I just need to consider this term over here, the, uh, I lost my sword. We cannot teach without swords. Now, uh, I just need to consider the uh, term inside that corresponds to yt, right? And that, of course, is simply the log of the, the negative log of the probability assigned to the th symbol in the align sequence. So the derivative of this with respect to the output of the network is the derivative of, is, is, an, is a row vector where each entry corresponds to the derivative of that term uh, with respect to the probability assigned to each of the symbols in your vocabulary, right? And of course, this one over here is just the log probability of the specific symbol on the best path. The rest of the symbols don't figure. So the derivatives with respect to the probabilities assigned to the other symbols are all zero, right? And the only thing that remains is minus, it is negative of log of y. The derivative of log of y with respect to y is one over y, we know this. And so the gradient, or rather the derivative of the overall divergence with respect to yt is going to be a row vector with zeros everywhere, except for the one symbol, the position corresponding to the one symbol that's on the best path. And that one entry is going to be minus one over the probability assigned to that symbol by the network. Now this is all again, just a rehash of what we've done in the past, but you, get, but, you know, it's applied to the specific context. And so now that we know how to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to each of the outputs of the network, it's easy. You can, up, you can update the network. So the overall training is gonna be something like this. Uh, you're gonna initialize either the alignments or the model. It's probably more useful to initialize the alignment saying you know it's uniformly uh, segmented, but either way is fine. And then uh, you're going to start off with a model. If you initialize the alignments, you're going to train the model with your alignments. If you initialize the model, you have an initial model. With that model, you're going to go through each of the training instances and find the best path, best alignment for the training instance. And then you're going to use the best alignment for the training instance as the ground truth. And then you're going to use that to update your model. Then you can iterate the process. So again, there are a couple of different uh, uh, options over here because your model keeps getting updated and we like to do SGD. So you can either sort of first go through a phase where you align all of your training data and then use these alignments to update the model or you can keep improving or during SGD, the actual estimation of alignment can be the first step of computing derivatives. Either is fine, right? The second one's probably more effective. Now, there's a problem with this thing that some of you have already pointed out. In that, if you're starting off with a crap model, what is the guarantee that you're going to get anything useful to begin with when you're aligning it, right? There is none. And it turns out that it doesn't really matter. If you work with a large enough amount of data, if you're Google, you have one billion training sentences, eventually the network figures it out. This works. But if you have limited amounts of training data, the limited is, can still be a fairly large number, then always finding the most likely decode can nonetheless lead you into uh, a uh, suboptimal local minimum. And so 
the actual model may not be great. So the alternate solution is, let me not consider just the best alignment, the most likely alignment. If I go, over, go back to this graph, this graph has, shows many different ways of aligning the input to the output. Let me consider all of these, right? But then not all of these graphs, all of these alignments are equally probable. Some alignments are more probable than others. So I'm going to consider every possible alignment, but I'm going to weight the loss, the contribution of, the, of that alignment to the loss by the probability of that alignment, right? So uh, that's the alternate thing. That's what we're gonna go through in the next class. For now, we're done. Questions? Thank you.